Welcome everyone to week number five in Biology 120. It's Monday morning. It's also Memorial Day, so I'd like to take just a minute to thank everyone who is in active military service or who has participated in mil military service through the years. I want to thank you for your service to our country to help ensure our freedoms that we enjoy every single day. I'd also like to remember all of those who have fought and died for our country through the generations because that's really what Memorial Day is about. So I'd like to thank them too, including my father and my father-in-law. And with that being said, let's get into what we've got going on this week. A quick note here about what we did last week. You learned about metabolism, which is the breakdown of food. And the whole purpose of breaking down food is to provide energy for cells in the form of ATP molecules, adenosine triphosphate, and also to make subunits of molecules that we can then build together in anabolic reactions to produce molecules that we need. And we also learned about photosynthesis, which is taking sunlight energy and carbon dioxide and producing glucose for the food produced by autotrophs. So we talked about autotrophs being the basis of ecosystems, which is terribly important. We need those organisms that do photosynthesis in order to provide a lot of food for organisms through all kinds of food webs in ecosystems. So this week is all about DNA, of course. I'm going to love this week. Um, your chapters are 10, 14, and 15. Make sure you at least skim through those chapters in your OpenStax Biology 2nd Edition textbook. I want you to read through module the Module 5 overview and watch the video substitutes. So there are videos listed that won't come up, but I'm going to have substitute videos in this announcement that you can look at to take a look at um, cell replication and translation and transcription. So the job of DNA is not to replicate. The job of DNA is to make a bunch of enzymes. And the way that it does that, because remember, we've talked about enzymes. The enzymes run the biochemistry in cells. <clears throat> the way that DNA does that, it is, is that it is converted into a molecule of RNA for specific sections of the DNA, and that's called transcription. And then the RNA is used to make chains of amino acids, and chains of amino acids are also called proteins. That's translation. So that's what some of those videos are about. Take a look at those because they're really important. So what have you got to do this week? You've got discussion board postings. Remember, your initial post is always due on Thursdays. So the initial post this week is posing a question to you. Is cancer a problem with cell division or mitosis or is it a genetic disease meaning genes are turned on or off to produce cancer or is it both now here i'm going to give you the hint again this week if there's other, ever a question like this and the choice is both it's going to be both otherwise they wouldn't even ask you that so anyway uh, let's talk about this for a second <clears throat> so cancer is formed by your cells that are dividing out of control and taking up all of your nutrients too many nutrients anyway and crowding out other cells of yours and doing all kinds of, of bad things so we know the basics of cancer and we also know that the most important bad consequence of cancer is that it metastasizes and that that means it moves to other parts of the body okay so is cancer a problem with cell division or is it a problem with genes so let's take a look for example for just a moment at the cell cycle so i have drawn this out for you because i cannot find a good picture of this so many cell cycle pictures leave out something terribly terribly important so on the right here i have a picture of the cell cycle and you got all these G's and letters and all that. So what does that mean? This is just representing the life cycle of a cell. Okay. So first of all, we have G1. In G1, the G1 phase of the life cycle of a cell 
you have general growth of the cell. So you, you have an increase in the size of the cell. You have an increase in the number of mitochondria. You have an increase in all kinds of different molecules that you need. So it's just general growth. So we start with G1. Well, what does G mean anyway? It doesn't mean growth. It actually means gap because we didn't know what was happening in the cells for a long time. So we had gap one and gap two over here on the other side of the cell cycle. But anyway, we now know what's going on. So there's general growth. Okay, I'm going to skip over G0 for just a second. Then you get into the synthesis stage of the life cycle. This is where DNA is replicated. So the cell has grown large enough, it has made all the components that it needs, just as in general as a cell, where it can now divide. So now it replicates this DNA, because you got to have two copies of the DNA in order for that cell to divide, and then each of the two new daughter cells get DNA. All right, then you've got the gap 2 phase, or G2. G2 phase is where all the cellular machinery is made that is needed for cell division. So centrioles, I don't know if you, you've um, touched on this in any other class because we're not going to do too much of that in here. Um, the mitotic spindles and all that. All the cell machinery that's needed for cell division gets manufactured in G2. All right, then keep on moving around the cell cycle. We have mitosis then. So that's the splitting of the nucleus and dividing up the DNA in the two new daughter cells. And then cytokinesis is where the actual, the rest of the, the cell pinches together and divides. Or in like plant cells, a new cell wall is put down between the uh, daughter cells. Okay, so the thing that I haven't talked about yet is that G0. So in the life cycle of a cell, the purpose of the cell is not to divide. The purpose of a cell is to do work. So when a cell is in G1, it will stop in what we call G0 phase. G0 does not mean it's, do, it's doing nothing. It is actually doing the work that it is supposed to do. So part of G1 is the G0 phase where the cell cycle stops, cell division stops, and the cell does its work. Doesn't this make sense? Don't your cells have jobs to do? What's the purpose of a red blood cell? To carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen to the cells, carbon dioxide away from the cells. What's the purpose of a muscle cell? To contract and make your bones move. Um, What's the purpose of a nerve cell? To allow electrical currents to move up and down to cause things to happen in your body. So there's work that cells have to do, and they do this in G0. Now, why am I talking about the cell cycle? Because this all has to do with cell division and cancer cells. The problem with cancer cells is that they never stop in G0. They go around and around and around this cell cycle and they do not stop in G0. So they continuously divide, even when there are problems with the cell. So there are checkpoints also in the cell cycle where a cell will grow and grow and grow and grow. And then at a certain point in G1, if the cell has not grown properly, grown to the right size, has the right organelles in it, there's a checkpoint in G1 where the cell will say, put on the brakes. We got to wait until everything is right before we move on. Cancer cells ignore those checkpoints in the cell cycle. And it doesn't matter if there are too many chromosomes, if there are not enough chromosomes, if there's not enough cell material, if there's not enough organelles to do the work. Cancer cells don't care. They just keep going around and around and around the cell cycle. So I wanted to explain that to you because like I said, I couldn't find a really good graphic on this. And that G0 phase is tremendously important and not enough people talk about it. Okay, um, the genes, now y'all have probably heard of cancer genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, they have to do with breast cancer and also or ovarian cancer. Um, 
there are there are many other cancer genes and i'm sure that you've heard of these there are tumor suppressor genes that get out of whack that have mutations in them and they no longer can suppress tumors there are proto oncogenes which are precursor onco cancer genes in your cells that get turned on and become oncogenes so you're going to need to look up some information about that so that you can give us a real good def, um, real good discussion of these two ideas having to do with cancer cells. In your response post, and I think also in this initial post, you're going to talk about environmental carcinogens. A carcinogen is anything that causes cancer. So everything, you know, ultraviolet light, you know that. Smoking, you know that. So anyway, and there's so, so many. What are some environmental carcinogens and how could we properly remove these from the environment? So those should be included in your response post. And don't forget to do this. Don't just say, oh, great job talking about mitosis and cancer genes. Hello, fellow classmate. Um, but remember, those response posts also have to have some information in them. And this is what they need to include. All right, what else do we have going on? Milestone three of the final project. This has to do with the methods of conservation for your particular topic. So how are we gonna preserve forests that we keep tearing down because we wanna get harvest the wood and make agricultural lands and that sort of thing? Uh, why is education important for this particular topic? What are some solutions and have lots, please? What are some solutions to your particular problem? What are some ethical considerations, including laws, regulations, guidelines that are in place or need to be put in place to change your topic so that it's not a problem anymore? What are the positive and negative aspects of the issue? There are always positive aspects. Otherwise, this would not be an issue at all. So for example, um, some of y'all are doing water pollution. What is the positive aspect of this issue? There must be some reason that industries dump industrial waste into waterways. Why? Because it's cheaper, of course, than getting it handled. Now, you, you all know that. Money. Um, so there is a positive aspect to this because, you know, somebody's benefiting from this somehow. Uh, what's the positive aspect? Some positive outcome for deforestation? Well, people are earning money by logging these forests, including the Amazonian rainforest. Uh, people are making money. Businesses are making money. People are having are uh, have jobs because of this. And also, the last thing is the personal impact. How does this affect you, and how are you going to move forward and do your part to help correct whatever this situation is? So that's milestone three of final project. You're gonna include citations and references, at least three for this section also. And this time, the format is PowerPoint slides. You don't have to put information in the speaker's notes, but you will for the final project. But you're going to need to make PowerPoint slides for milestone three. This is not just an essay. Neither was milestone one or milestone two. But this is going to be slides. Now, you don't have to use PowerPoint. Google Slides, that's free. You can use that. And I'm sure there are other applications for this. Um, but anyway, I just say PowerPoint because most people know that. And label all of your sections. Conservation, one slide. Conservation, next slide. Education, next slide. Solutions, okay? That makes sure that I know that you know which sections these are, okay? And I hope that you have a wonderful week. I hope that you have a restful day today if you have it off. Um, maybe you're getting some schoolwork done, I'm not sure. Uh, a couple of things to leave you with. I have a picture back there of a whale tail, humpback whale tail from um, my experiences in 2019 when I got to go to Massachusetts and do some whale watching and my four amigos back there want to tell you hello this Monday morning. They are my succulent plants and so far I have not killed them. <laughs> it's only been a few weeks. <laughs> I'm just saying it may be coming. 
So anyway, have a great week this week. And as always, if you need anything, please email me, m.sigman at snhu.edu. And one last thing I'm going to leave you with is a little DNA fingerprinting. So you can stop here if you want to. It's perfectly fine. But of course, I love DNA fingerprinting. I mean, I did my dissertation on it. So anyway, I love forensic science, love DNA fingerprinting. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit about DNA typing, profiling, DNA fingerprinting. Like I said, you can stop here if you want to. So DNA fingerprinting was developed in 1985 by Sir Alec Jeffries. I have a picture of him right here from the University of Leicester in um, England. And he developed this technique where he could tell the difference between people by looking at their DNA patterns. And what he did was, oh, there goes my husband pulling out the driveway. So anyway, there... He took the DNA from individuals, chopped it up, and then looked at variable regions in the, in the DNA, and he could tell the difference between people by looking at their patterns. So an example of the type of work that he did is located on the lower right-hand side of this slide. This is called an RFLP um, radiograph right here. This is what DNA fingerprinting used to look like bunch of bars and everybody knows that right barcodes of DNA <clears throat> so the first case that was ever used where DNA was ever used in a criminal analysis was with Dr. Alec Jeffries in 1985 the police department had heard that he had this technique where you could distinguish between people by looking at DNA and they had three murders in um, three different villages in England, and they had no idea who had done this. So they went to Alec Jeffries and they said, hey, listen, could you draw blood from all these men in, the, in these villages? Because these have been rapes and murders. Could you draw blood from the men in these villages and figure out who did this by the DNA that was left behind? And he said, well, I can sure try. So he did, and they started drawing blood. Oh, they drew over 5,000 samples. I think it was 5,500 samples of blood from men who lived in these three villages. Well, um, the police had someone who confessed, and so they brought him in. They collected his blood, and Alec Jeffrey said, Well, I've got good news and bad news for you. Um, this DNA fingerprinting thing is really working out pretty good. Um, I see the profile from the rape cases, and I'm getting lots of um, DNA profiles or fingerprints from all of these people that you're being, that you're bringing in. But you know the suspect that you have, um, he didn't do it. So even though he confessed, he did not do it. Eventually, though, the perpetrator was caught, and his name is Colin Pitchfork of all names. Yes, that is the real perpetrator of these three murders. And the reason why they didn't catch him right away was because he convinced one of his friends, Ian Kelly, to go in and give his blood twice using Colin uh, Pitchfork's ID that second time. Well, Ian Kelly went to the pub and he was drinking a bit, plus he had the flu, so he felt bad, and he was drinking a, a bit. And he started telling everybody what he had done, and one of the women went to the police and told them what he said. So they checked Colin Pitchfork, and sure enough, he had done these three crimes. So that was the first case of DNA fingerprinting that was ever used in criminal analysis of any, any type. In 1988, the FBI began using uh, this technique, um, but of course we didn't even have CODIS then. CODIS is the Combined DNA Index System, which is a database full of these profiles. We hadn't even started that yet. Um, but in 1988, we started using DNA fingerprinting in the United States. And then this has moved to state agencies and local agencies. There are lots of DNA labs all around the country now and all around the world. Um, the technique that Alec Jeffries used was used first. And this is the RFLP technique. But then we moved into PCR. And we're going to get into that this next week or the next one, um, which is the polymerase chain reaction. And this is the one where you can take 
tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of DNA from a single hair, from saliva, from touching a gun, um, just the tiniest amounts of DNA to develop a profile. The latest things that have been happening with DNA in criminal cases is the use of genealogy websites to catch uh, perpetrators of some type. And one of the last ones, well, one of the most famous ones that has been caught so far as the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, who was active in the 70s over into the 80s, I do believe. Um, but he has now been arrested. Oh, he hasn't gone to trial yet. Um, but he has been arrested, and that's because the police submitted a DNA profile to a genealogy website like Ancestry.com, but it was not Ancestry.com. And there was a fairly close match to him and uh, investigators figured out who he was by eliminating all the other family members. And then they collected his DNA surrepti surreptitiously and determined that it actually was him. So there's all kinds of things going on with DNA and criminal analysis right now. Uh, new, new techniques. Um, DNA analysis will happen out in the field, I think, pretty shortly, at least within the next 10 years. There will be a way for you to run a DNA profile out in the field to see what you get. So I hope you enjoyed this because this is just a little aside because this is my thing. Um, if you have any questions about that, please let me know. So anyway, have a wonderful week and I will talk to you as soon as you let me know something. All right. Have a good week.